Well, for unto us a son was born and a child was given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called the Wonderful, Counselor, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Then we called him. Christopher I, when he was born, rain fall from sky. Then call him. Christopher I, when he was grown in near plains he fly. Then call him. Christopher I, a young break the chain, weep not, don't cry. Then call him. Christopher I, read the Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. Born near the city of Harar, the inspiration for Bob Marley's guitar. People crowd him like some big superstar. It no matter if a England or Cote d'Ivoire. Well, my advice. Tell them that's the people first choice. Lion voice, make the lion let them feel nice. Lion voice, be the lion cubs we sacrifice. Lion voice, got to show the people them the life. Well, lion voice. Greetings in that divine name of His Imperial Majesty, Emperor Haile Selassie I, the first, King Rastafari. Glory and honor in the name of His chosen Queen. Empress was zero menin. My name is Kwasi Bansu, aka the Chasmach Kwasi, aka Ras Kwasi, aka the Reading Ras, aka the Pan African Happy Man. I'm an entertainment attorney, I'm an author, I'm an artist, I'm an actionist, and today I stand before you as the host of the Lion Voice vlog. And today we have a special edition of the Lion Voice plan we're gonna go into the lion voice time machine and we're gonna go and examine some Ethiopian history um, as written in um, I and I first book Haile Selassie's Ethiopia volume 1 the rise of the priestly warrior kings I thought it would be interesting to do a kind of in-depth look at some of the characters that appear in the book um, the historical figures um, that we write about and I said there is no better place to start than with the archetype um, in the modern era of the priestly warrior king who am I talking about I'm talking about Emperor Tedros II now before we touch on Emperor Tedros and his life and we go into some of the history um, this concept of a priestly warrior king uh, it comes it's a it's a biblical archetype that you see um, from Abraham coming straight up where a lot of the patriarchs that were mentioned they were uh, men of God but they also were the head of their army engaged in battle and they ruled their regions as kings you know de facto kings even though um, Abraham is called a shepherd when you look in the Kebron Agas um, they're, they're listed as kings you know all of the descendants um, because they controlled large areas they had servants they had cattle livestock so they were all functioning in this way so and in the ancient world a man of nobility this was kind of the, the apex archetype meaning that you know that all your blessings came from the Almighty you studied you know the refined man of, of the ancient world would have studied the holy books um, he was in charge of being the priest for his house making sure that his wife and children were brought up in the ways of the Most High etc so that would have been his domain but these nobles also had private armies um, engaged in battle and in the ancient world, you know, you're, you were judged by how you conducted yourself on the battlefield, by your subordinates, your servants, everybody is watching, you know? So if you're a weak card and you are just laying back, yes, if you have the financial resources, you can control. But if you really want to uh, become legend and, en and enjoy, you know, the undying loyalty, 
of your men or your soldiers you had to lead by example and this is leads us into the story of again the archetype of the priestly warrior king Emperor Tedros the second who was Emperor Tedros the second well he was born as Casa Hailu in a place called Quora Q-W-A-R-A -A. Uh, so if I'm butchering the pronunciation my Ethiopian family please below you can spell it phonetically um, but yes he was born as Casa Hailu and he was born in 1818 what else was going on in 1818 well just to give you some perspective in 1818 the African Methodist Church was being established it was founded April 9 1816 um, in America you had Andrew Jackson uh, former president who was massacring the Indian um, indigenous people to end the first Seminole War that was August 18th um, jump forward uh, four years uh, to 9, 1822 you had um, the legendary Denmark Vesey somebody told on him um, in May of 1822 and stopped a uh, uprising of over 5,000 you know Africans in the Americas who were prepared to rise and give their lives for freedom so just to let you know um, 1818 at the birth of Casa Hailu the rest of the world outside of the isolated Ethiopia um, the black world was still in colonialism and bondage um, in Jamaica uh, there were laws passed to return and register slaves in 1816 so you know slavery is at its height um, when a young Casa Hailu was born near the borders of Sudan which itself is controlled by the Ottoman Empire um, in that time referred to as the Turks um, his father Atu Hailu you know was a man of, of nobility and um, he died at a young age um, his mother you know because of the death of his father at a young age his mother was in a precarious position um, because she no longer enjoyed the support um, of the father there were rumors that um, she was forced to sell bitter uh, bitters something called koso um, modern literature now says that in, in some instances that this was a rumor and he likely wasn't all that poor you know his, his mother also came from status um, her name is slipping I right now but I'll put it um, here so you can see and, and look it up for yourself but it was likely that you know um, he had a little, she had a little bit of status based on her own family lineage um, so he was not poor but he was also not included in the inner circle of the upper class and nobility so he grew up as an outcast um, to his father's noble roots um, he grew up in the shadow of a great the Chasmach named Maru of Dembia and this was in the era of the Zemini Masafit Masafit Fint Masafint the Zemini Masafint I may be butchering this people so if I am Ethiopian family put the phonetic spelling down there but not above correction um, but this is also translated as the era of princes so this period of Ethiopia history for those who love the Game of Thrones analogies and the, and the Lord of the Rings analogies, this was an era of chaos where warlords, you know, the races were moving like warlords. All of these different areas had their private armies and they would war. There were emperors that were crowned and that ruled in Gondar, but they were puppets. They were controlled by these powerful races who, again, were moving like warlords and we'll talk about some of the major players a little bit later um, but because 
he did not enjoy the support of his father, a young Kasahailu, was then taken uh, notice by one of his other uncles, who was a nobleman, and he convinced his mother to allow the young boy to go to a monastery um, to be educated. And this was important because in Ethiopia, in 1820, um, 1818, uh, the church was the main educator. Literacy was not widespread. Um, you know, literacy was generally taught by the church. So either in the Orthodox Church or in the monasteries, um, children of nobles would go study. And this particular monastery um, had a lot of uh, children of nobles studying there, and they would study the Bible, the Ethiopian version, of course, which has several more books than the Western Bible. Uh, they would be studying the Psalms of David, the Keber Nagas, um, learning about Ethiopian history and culture um, and he was sent there again by his uncle the Chazmach Kenfu who became kind of his benefactor and, and someone who looked out for him someone in the nobility checked for his father and said you know what this youth showing potential let me take him under my wing but this was the era of princes this was an era of chaos and in this region close to the Sudanese border, um, the, the Chazmach who was running the region felt slighted by the power structure of the time and decided to exact revenge by destroying the monastery, um, attacking, knowing that the children of many of the nobles were there to send a message. Fortunately, the young Casa Hail was able to escape um, but this was not a good time for leaders because it was so precarious um, the power was constantly shifting uh, there were some main power players and this time the Aromo were actually um, the most powerful players in the country um, the Yuju Aromo um, that were based in Wallo were the ones who really had the power. Um, Empress Menen, she was um, probably the most powerful player in, in the entire realm. And she enforced her power through her son. Her son who, you know, attained his titles at a very young age. Um, but she ruled in the shadows. Her son, Ras Ali, was the most powerful of all of the warlords of the realm at that time. But you also had Ras Kushu of Gojam, Ras Webe of Gandhar, Ras Haile Malakat of Shoa, and Ras Ube of Tigray. And again, if I've butchered any of these names, my Ethiopian family, please um, drop a comment below um, and spell it phonetically so that in future we can make corrections because we're going to be going in-depth in Ethiopian history on this channel. Um, so important um, to really examine some of these legendary figures. Um, what they did great and some of their flaws. But yes, Empress Menon was the power behind the throne. She was married to Emperor Johannes III who ruled you know, from Gandhar but he was an alleged glutton and wine bibber and so was not ruling and this is where we can tie it into the relationship topics um, so men if you are not driven with purpose and you are not on your square so to speak in terms of doing your things then you get pushed to the side the queen is running the show. Now your kingdom has effectively become a queendom. Um, and you are a Prince Philip in other business. Uh, and if you know, Queen Elizabeth is married. Her husband is not a king, he's a prince. So England effectively right now is a queendom. So all of that, that aside, um, Empress Menon, you know, was the major power player 
at a time when a young Casa Hailu was now uh, without a home. The monastery that he had been living in and being trained in had been destroyed, but it engendered in him a love of books and learning. Um, his uncle, who was, was his patron, the Chasmach Kinfu, um, was still around and still had some sway and some power. So eventually, Casa Hailu goes to live with his uncle. Um, but this is one of the things um, we have to understand. Uh, Casa Hailu was one of them youths where just brilliant at everything he did, you know, physically um, above average. Um, you know, people loved him, he was attractive, he had charisma, he had discipline, he was hard working. So everywhere he went, you know, people just a big him up, big him up. And this did not sit well with the Charles Match Kinfu. Why? Because he was really building a legacy for his sons. And even though, yes, your family, um, you know, why you come take over my thing and my son, them don't get anything. So he, you know, that, that started to build a riff between um, the Jazz Match Kinfu and Casa Hilo. Uh, eventually, the Jazz Match uh, Kinfu died, and his uh, area, which was the same uh, Maru, uh, the Kwara region, was given not to his sons um, and not to Casa Hilo but it was given to another um, benefactor of, of Empress Menin, you know. So, without a patron, his father wasn't there, Kasu Hailu now goes on the run and becomes an outlaw because in those times, in the era of princes, if you didn't have a powerful warlord backing you and you had any inkling that you might be a threat to the throne or you might have any noble blood, you were vulnerable. Uh, so he went on the run and becomes an outlaw. But again, this is not an ordinary youth. This is a youth that's disciplined. This is a youth that is trained in all things. Um, because his love for reading that was kindled at the monastery, he's ravenous when it comes to the reading of books. He's building himself, and so followers start to come uh, uh, surrounding him. He's, you know, all of the, the young men, he's, he's building support um, as he moves through. So he becomes an outlaw. But this is not an ordinary outlaw. He becomes a type of Robin Hood where he's robbing from the nobility and he's redistributing to the poor and the peasants and he's not a man that as he grows in power he pulls himself above the people and this is where his upbringing came in because he was outcast he never forgot where he came from he never forgot what it was like to be on the outside so he would sleep with his soldiers everything you know they would get up and see him plowing in the field with the farmers um, distributing um, their bounty that they would get from raiding you know different shipments and things they would be distributing it to the poor people so the whole countryside now is a buzz this young Casa Hilo so over time he starts to gain attention and followers because he he has it now because they're raiding so he's able to build so he's building a little private army around him and because of his example and because of his knowledge of books and because when you're reading these books you're reading about ancient battles and things so he gained the knowledge of warfare that was unmatched during the era of princes this is a young um, man on the come up without titles this is just Casa Hilo um, because he's on the Sudanese border and he's moving around he's an outlaw the Turks catch wind and he engages them in battle he's a patriot um, proud Ethiopian so you know there was always tension on the borders however the Egyptians 
professional trained army handed him a, 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 a whooping or as we say in Jamaica a beating and he learned from that because yes he was talented he was gifted he had his private army but he was fighting the ancient days war cavalry swords spears maybe a few musket the Egyptians rapid fire guns different things so it didn't work out so he, he had a wake-up call in terms of how underprepared Ethiopia was to confront a modern fighting force um, so he learned from that and he adapted because he was again he was a learner brilliant and now what happens he continues to raid until he gets the attention of who the big person in the realm, the power behind the throne, Empress Menen, starts to notice. So she sends her son, Ras Ali. We need to pacify this person before he gets out of hand. So they arrange a marriage with Ras Ali's daughter and hoping to, that that will bring him into the family and kind of pacify him. But it does not. Casa has a vision. This is what people didn't understand. You know, he really saw himself as a prophetic figure um, and a savior for Christendom. You know, because of his dislike of the Turks, his, his plan and his mission was to march an army from Ethiopia all the way to Jerusalem and to liberate it from the Muslims for the Christians um, and have Christendom reign from the mountains of Zion all the way to Jerusalem. So he was expansive in his vision. Um, he saw what was happening in Ethiopia with the era of princes of counterproductive and petty and that unity. So he formed this vision of a united Ethiopia while he was on the battlefield. And again, he's winning hearts and minds as he goes along. Um, he couldn't control, be controlled. So um, Empress Menem decides, you know what? This upstart needs to be put down. And this is where the epic fantasy element of Ethiopian history because Empress Menin didn't sit in her palace and say go deal with him you know what she did she rose an army of 20,000 of our top soldiers in the realm and she herself put on her buckle armor sat on her horse and like I'm gonna show this man a who run things in a Zion and Empress Menin rides into battle And her husband has to come with her because, you know, him probably a drink him Heineken. No, sorry, Tej. Him a drink him, te him, him Tej wine and him drunk and, you know. But the Empress is serious now. She has to move it. Look away if you don't ride beside me, my youth. Put on the, put on the meat and the, and, and the alcohol and go up on your horse and make her go in a buckle. So the two of them ride into battle, but remember, they're battling a master tactician, technician, emperor, um, the future emperor. They didn't know that at the time. Casa Hilo meets them and in battle, and Empress Menin is knocked off her horse by one of his men and captured. Her husband is also later captured, and so. The army is forced to back off because we would deal with your leader if you don't back off. So Casa Hilo wins the day. Now Ras Ali is in a precarious position because his mother, you know, the one who calls the shots, is there. He has the largest army in the realm, but can't lose mommy. What are we all gonna do? Um well they they made a deal. Um, likely uh, arranged through the Orthodox Church which in a lot of these situations acted as a mediator between warring factions so the outlaw castle is given land and titles for his her release and now he becomes the Chasmach Casa the leader of Quara and Dembia so these are areas that he was homeless he was running around as an outlaw now uh, him run things as a Chasmach and you know I'm a 
the Charles March. I gave myself that name. It's a powerful position in the ancient history. It means commander of the gate. It's a level before you become a Ras. And I gave myself that name because His Majesty Rastafari was Lich, then he became the Charles March and Ras. And I wanted to emulate all of the stages. I don't want to jump ahead. So my elders gave me the title of Ras Kwasi, which is why in the beginning year we say Ras Kwasi, but I chose the title of the Charles March because the Charles March, when you study the history, there have been legendary the Charles Marches. So we want to bring that forward into the consciousness of our Rastafari liberty because it's part of the life and the liberty of Lich Tafari. So it has to be part of our and life and liberty of the Charles March. That's a sidebar. Anyhow, we're leading up to an epic battle of epic proportion because now that um, the Chaz Match Casa has lands and title they were hoping that everything would calm down but no he's still taking it to anyone who stands in his way of his larger vision remember he's he's almost like he's a possessed man he has a vision of a united Ethiopia so him step in a gojam destroy the armies of Raskushu and once they saw okay this man is not stopping now Ras Ali said all right you take down mommy we love you you take down daddy we love you but now you're going like you're a bad man around you and here what you're a bad man me a bad man me run Zion so what did Ras Ali do he rose an army of a hundred thousand Amen. Uh, Hundred thousand men to destroy uh, the Jazz March Casa. But guess what happened? The Jazz March Casa and his disciplined fighting force who had learned from the defeat from the Egyptians and how to deal with artillery. And remember when they're fighting, they're capturing different weapons and thing because that is the, the benefit of always being at war, which did which Casa was always at war. You're always getting new inside no so these he had a well-oiled fighting machine when you rise an army of a hundred thousand some of them man they are farmer they might come off them field because you don't need this big army all the time so you beat the war drum and you have some man some man have him picks but he's, his heart is not in it so when they meet up with a crack fighting force history recalls what happened so after he destroys ras ali tedros goes after the chas match webby of Gondar. 18, by 1855, Tedros is crowned Emperor Tedros. And we'll end it right there. Um, and we'll do part two um, after his, he, he became uh, Emperor because this is also a tragic tale. Um, but we need more time. I don't want these to be too long. But just to give you some context, 1855 is when Emperor Tedros II, Castle, um, the Charles March Castle becomes Emperor Tedros II. In 1849, Harriet Tubman escaped from slavery. By 1856, the bounty on Harriet Tubman said was 40,000 US dollars, which was big money in them time. She'd already been making several um, excursions to the south on the Underground Railroad. So this is happening while in Zion. This outlaw who, who came from an outlaw, a man of the people, the soldier's soldier, had become emperor. Um, in 1855, states such as Georgia and Tennessee removed binding laws in the interstate trade of enslaved people. So they free up. You're allowed to take your slaves across borders. Slavery is in its hide in America, um, to give you um, some context. But at the same time, John Mercer Langston became the first African-American elected to serve in the United States government following his election in Ohio. So even in the midst of slavery, um, black people are still striving. So we want to counter this narrative that black people were docile. And you see by the Denmark Vesey revolution when um, Casa Hailu was born up until um, he becomes emperor that black people who are enslaved and in colonialism are striving for greatness and striving um, within their humanity. So I'm gonna cut it there. This is part one 
of the rise of uh, Casa Hailu, aka Emperor Tedos II, um, and this is all captured, you know, what I've read in my first work, um, Haile Selassie's Ethiopia Volume 1, The Rise of the Priestly Warrior Kings. So if you want more detail about what we're talking about, all of this is included in, um, in Haile Selassie's Ethiopia, The Rise of the Priestly Warrior Kings. So I hope you enjoyed it. If you like this type of content, drop a comment. Um, we'll do a lot more. We'll do Emperor Tejo. Somebody asked for Emperor um, Izana, who was also mentioned in the book. So we'll do Emperor Izana next. Um, if you have requests, you know we we take requests of Ethiopian uh, figures from history, whatever we can find. Um, so if you like this type of content, drop a comment. Again, we're just getting started on this channel. We have interviews. We have vlog posts on the moves. Um, just forwarding from Toronto. We're gonna do some uh, some content from Toronto. Holy for things coming down uh, in the future. So get ready um, because the time has come for the lions to tell their own story. And this is the lion's voice. Lion voice.